All right, we are live. Let's wait for a couple more people to get in here. We'll get rolling, Nicholas. Give everybody a chance to get in and ask their questions. All right, this is Keith Niebuhr with Gators Online, joined by Nick Delatore of Gators Online. This is Talking Gators. We appreciate everybody stopping by. We'll go for about 45 minutes, but we do have a special guest tonight to not only recap the Florida Florida State game, but just talk about the season in general. And Shane, I've got to uh, I've got to introduce you. I was a student at Florida when you were there, uh, three times All SEC, 90, 91, 92, All American, fifth in the Heisman voting. And I think that's one thing, Nick, that people forget. He was fifth in the Heisman Trophy voting. Emmett Smith never finished higher than fifth in the Heisman voting. So that's the kind of caliber of player that Shane was at Florida. Set all kinds of records, threw for over nine thousand yards. Uh, finished first in the SEC in 1990 uh, and then won the first official SEC title for the Florida Gators in 1991. And then in 1992, led the Gators to the SEC championship game. The first SEC championship game, Nick, you were just a kid. And that was against Alabama, the 28-21 game at Legion Field. Again, we're joined by Shane Matthews, Gator. Great, Shane. We appreciate you stopping by, man. No problem, guys. Glad to be Shane, here. Shane, that, that felt like the British Open when like Tiger and Phil were paired together. And they're just like going through all of Tiger's majors, and Phil hadn't gotten one yet. And he's like, "All right, all right, all right, we get it, we get it." Like, like let's, let's, <laughs> of all the things let's, Shane let's did, I, Nick, of all the things Shane did, I don't know if he remembers this. I hope to God he does. But maybe one of the f- top five Gator Growl skits of all time was the sh- the take on Wayne's World, Shane's World, Shane's World, Party Time, yeah. excellent. And Shane, I think you had a joke about the Akron Akron Zips with a Zip Burger back then as well, too, if my memory's right. I don't know. Yeah, if you remember I don't remember that. everything, but that was uh, that was pretty cool about the skit, Shane's World. A lot, a lot of old uh, young people don't have any idea what that is. No, not at all, <laughs> not at all. All right, Nick, uh, I'll let you jump in. Let's let's. I mean, we got this special guest. We should point out that he's the color commentator, also for the Gator Football Radio Network, and does an unbelievable job. So, Nick, take it away. What do you got for Mr. Matthews? Yeah, Shane. It. Um, I, I think I before this season, I said Graham Mertz was fine. That he would be non-offensive, but probably not win Florida any games. Um, and and I didn't think, you know, I called him a, a game manager, but I, I think that I wasn't, I didn't mean it as a dirty term as some people take it. Um, I think he 100% exceeded my expectations. Um, you got to see him even more than we did, um, you know, in, in practice, spring, fall. Uh, what did you expect from Graham? And, and what did you see based on your expectations uh, this season? Well, I thought Graham played exactly how I thought he would. When I first saw him, I, I was not around for the spring or the spring game, uh, but I, I saw him the first practice, and I was like, man, this guy is a legit quarterback, uh, extremely accurate, anticipates very well. Uh, you know, he, he had all the attributes that, you know, Coach Spurrier believes in in quarterbacks. That's processing information, uh, mental and physical toughness, accuracy and anticipation. And I thought he played really well. I think he could have played better uh, if they would have utilized his talents a little bit more. Uh, Shane, can you hear us? I think Nick's on mute. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I hear yeah. You now. yeah, yeah. Um, to me, I thought Florida would lean on the running game and, and kind of leaned on like the short passing game. But you go to South Carolina, and and what I had asked, a big question I had had was, can Graham win you a game with his arm? And, and he answered that, two scoring drives on the road at South Carolina. Um, and then it almost looked like the offensive philosophy changed a little bit to me. And I think maybe necessarily, because George, Georgia, you were going to have to score. LSU, you were going to have to score. Missouri, you were going to have to score. And I thought, like, okay, well, they're going to start throwing it more. And, and I think Graham, even, even then, uh, looked good, but I, I think the offensive line lets him down. And I guess a question, Graham is quick to take the blame or, or, or jump in front of the bullet, jump in front of the criticism. Um, as a quarterback, and you're watching this, when Graham says, we all we see is him get hit 12 times in a game and peel himself up off the grass, what could he do better from what you can see? Just like protections, or is it just, hey, Florida's offensive line has to play better? Well, like I said earlier, you're going to get hit playing quarterback in the Southeastern Conference. It doesn't matter what kind of offensive line you have. Uh, he's mentally and physically really, really tough. Uh, I mean, I, we all know the offensive line could have played better. Um, 
I don't know if Graham could do much more with what he was asked to do. I, I personally would have loved to see more vertical passing. And people say, well, you can't protect long enough. Well, to throw the ball deep, sometimes you don't have to have a whole lot of time. You still may get hit, but you can let it go. Um, and we just we didn't do that at times for whatever reason. Maybe that's Billy's philosophy, but I just think three to four, maybe five shots a game, good things will happen. I mean, you look at the game the other night against Florida State, they didn't complete any of them, but we got like three pass interference calls. Mm. Uh, so you have to throw it down there because the game has changed. It favors the offense. Right. It's hard to cover people one-on-one. So throw it down there and see what, what can happen. Shane, you – Go ahead. Sorry, oh, keep going. You know, when you're watching that game and in, in, in the aftermath of that game the other night, the 24-15 Florida State win, obviously Florida led 15-14 going into the fourth quarter. Shane, we asked our, our subscribers this. I got to ask you, what were you most encouraged by in that game and what were you most discouraged by? What, what were your takeaways? Well, I love the way we came out. I mean, when we had them 12 nothing. I was like, man, th this is going perfectly. And then we get the ball, the good return after the safety, and we run the double reverse, which I have no problem with. I don't have a problem with the double reverse pass or something. I don't care too much for a double reverse kind of throwback screen to one of the reverse sides. But he was trying to take a shot there. And unfortunately, all the trick plays that Billy have, has run this year backfired. Um, I, I still think this team plays hard. Regardless of their their record, they played hard all year long. Uh, disappointing in that game was just losing it. Um, we had opportunities. We let it slip away. We had opportunities at Missouri. We let it slip away. Should have won the Arkansas game. I mean, you can go to a few plays here and there uh, all year long. Uh, every, every fan base can do that. So it, it was disappointing. I really thought this team would win a minimum of seven games, um, but I wasn't. I could. I, I wasn't sure from the the interior guys on both sides of the ball how they would play, and obviously that hurt us throughout the year. Shane, you were on a team that made a big jump from eighty nine to ninety seven and five to I think nine and two. Do you see? Do you see the ability in this team right now with what's coming back? Obviously, they got to keep all these guys, and then they've got to add some pieces. But do you see the ability to make that kind of a jump like you guys did from eighty nine to ninety? Obviously, you had a new coach. I get all that new system, new quarter, starting quarterback being you. But it, are, is there potential? I think that's what people want to know. Is there a light at the end of this tunnel? Can you see it? Well, I sure hope so. I, I don't know if they can make that jump. I mean, I think yeah. people people don't know if <laughs> – that 89 team, I didn't play a down, but you had some damn good defensive players on that team. Uh, you know, Coach Spurrier will tell you that, that that team was loaded with defensive talent. And offensively, we just had to find a way to put some points on the board. So – I'm not sure from a defensive standpoint if they have that talent. Um, now, from a skill standpoint on offense, I think they got some pretty good guys. Now, again, do you keep them? Do they go to the transfer portal? Who knows? Um, but next year's schedule, we all know, is difficult. But I think everybody's going to – whether you had a winning season this year, everybody's going to go through a transition period because of, of how the world is today. It um, going back to that to the um, the double reverse flea flicker whatever. First off, I think the the referees missed. It. I think he was outside the tackle box um, and threw the ball past the line of scrimmage. I think you might get away with uh, or or got a you know an intentional grounding that maybe you didn't have to get. Um, I didn't like the play call because I felt like you were running the ball well. To me, it felt like the same game plan that you had versus Tennessee, where it was. We just need to be successful on third down, have long extended drives, control the clock. The first two possessions, 13 plays, 13 plays. If you don't miss a kick, you're up 10 nothing. Your defense comes out with its hair on fire. Three, three, three and outs and a safety. Um, they're doing their part, you know, and they've been maligned for the last month, giving up, you know, 700 yards on the road at LSU. Uh, so my, my thing was, I think you just got caught up in the moment. The swamp was rocking after that safety. And you get caught up in the moment a little bit. Let's take the shot now. If we do this, the momentum swings, and we might, you know, put this game away in the first quarter. But the offense, to me, just hasn't been explosive, whether that's the players or the play-calling philosophy. Second and 26, that drive's dead. You, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and punt on second down because you're not getting a first down. So, to me, that drive then just killed the momentum. Give FSU credit. They come down and they score on the next one. But to me, it was just – I get the timing, but I think you just get caught up 
in the momentum and in and, and what's happening and you didn't need to. If you could just put together another drive like you had, um, you know, your first three drives were 13, 13, and then only five, but you had the ball on the FSU 40. So to me, it was just out of place and, and, and Billy getting caught, you know, in the hype of what was going on at the, at the time. Yeah, but if we if we hit a, see, I initially I thought it was a double reverse like flea flicker down the field, mm -hmm. but we pulled our we pulled our lineman out to run a screen back to Trey Wilson. That's why he was pressured so much. If they had stayed in, whether they can block or not, they at least get in the way to launch one down the field. Yeah, that's what I initially, which I have zero problem with that. I I do have a problem with running the screen because we couldn't get it off. But if we hit it. And it's nineteen nothing. The, the swamp is really rocking. Yeah, well, but 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 if you have a fourteen play drive and you put it in the end zone, they're still rocking. Just takes a little, a little bit yeah. longer to get that going. But um, that's one thing I think you hit on too. That I wanted to say is that I think when you say it, and when Billy says it, and I've said it a bunch, like, hey, this team's young, they fight, and I think fans are tired of hearing that they fight. I think what you do point to is they're fighting at five and six against you know florida state or they're fighting at five and five against missouri on the road down late to me that just says that you you still believe in the direction you still believe in in your coaches and in the program because i've seen teams in the 13 uh, 11 seasons i've covered here uh i've seen teams you know they take one punch in the mouth on a saturday and they say you know what don't want to get punched anymore let's just get on and get out of here so when i hear people say or when i say it myself Hey, these guys are still fighting. I think that's what I mean. It's like, hey, the the guys that are here are still bought in. You don't you don't have guys checking out. I agree with that. I think they play extremely hard. Uh, just unfortunately, can't finish and win games. Uh, I think they got some good skill on both sides of the ball. I just think it, this this football team, from an interior standpoint, especially defensively, I think the last three to five years, the front seven has not been SEC caliber. Uh, I thought uh, leading up to this year they they had addressed that, and I think they did to a degree, but it's still not where it needs to be. I think you've got guys, but you don't. This isn't a Sharif Floyd, Dominic Easley type of defensive line. Mm -hmm. I think it, they were the sum of their parts, and if you could have a healthy rotation, you'll get the most out of those guys. But yeah, you, you don't have any first team All SEC guys, and, and the the problem, the tough part is. You don't pause. You don't get to, you know, have a game, a, an Xbox controller and pause what George is doing. You have to build those offensive defensive lines to compete with Georgia, who's been doing it and, and recruiting that at an elite level for eight years now, nine years under Kirby. Yeah, and if, you look at, if you look at Florida State, the, the two best players on their football team, in my opinion, I know they get all these great skill guys on offense, is Jared Verse and mm -hmm. number 11. He is, I can't think of his name. Because when you can get after the quarterback with your front four and drop seven into coverage, it's a different ball game. And, 100%. I mean, you know, what, 17, 18 of their starters all came from the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. I know you don't want to build your whole team off of that, but Florida has got to find some front seven dudes that can play at a high, high level. Yeah, number 11 is Patrick Payton from Miami yes. Northwestern. Yeah. Shane, we hear so much about culture, and, and, and as a fan, a casual observer media, it's very hard to quantify what good culture means and what bad culture means. And I had somebody tell me once, they said, you know, I don't know that good culture wins you games, but bad culture can certainly lose you games. And I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, but right now there's some chatter. There's some people out there wondering, okay, what's the culture like on the team? Is it we've heard some things, that the fans, and, and yet they just lost a, two games by kicks took FSU to the fourth quarter. I mean, in other words, this could have been a different story. This could have been an eight-win team. These games came down to just a few plays. Uh, but I ask you, what does culture really – how much does it really impact things on Saturday? Well, I think it, it has a lot to do with uh, team unity, the team playing for one another. I mean, in today's world, everything is all about me, right? You know, what can I get? How much money can I make? You know, this damn NIL is, is a, just a freaking nightmare, quite honestly. Um, Billy has changed the culture. The culture, I mean, my son was on the team for three years and it, it got pretty bad. Um, and it takes time to get the right guys to buy in, believe in the coaching staff, believe, want to play for whatever logos on their helmet. 
you know, so I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I think the culture is better. Can it get better? I, I, I still think it can get a lot better. Okay. Uh, just as a, uh, I'm trying to get back on the screen, just uh, thoughts on Trey Wilson as, as a former quarterback. Is there any player comparison that you could make to him? And what do you like most about his his game? Obviously, uh, he does everything well. Yeah, I think he's outstanding. I, I even said in, in the summer between him, Andy Jean, and Aiden Mizell, they remind me of Ike Quezzi and Redale. Now, we had to go see him produce, but just from a talent standpoint, and I'm still very – I still would like to know why the other two never played. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm a guy – I want speed. I want to be able to throw a slant or a hitch and have somebody – make somebody miss and score. Um, but to answer your question, Trey Wilson is a unique, unique football player. Somebody asked me, do I think he's comparable to Kadarius Tony? I think he's better than Kadarius Tony. I think he's a much pol- better polished route runner. I think he's smoother catching the football. Uh, he's explosive. So uh, he's a guy we got to keep. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've always wanted to know why we've never lined up in, 10 personnel. I don't know if we've ever lined up in 10 personnel in two years. We're either in 12 or 11 personnel. And I would have loved to have seen us with Ricky Pearsall, Andy Jean, Trey Wilson, and Aiden Mizell, you know, those four guys out there at wide receiver. But we never did. Shane, we've actually got some breaking news going on as we speak. Nick, you want me to to break it to him? Go ahead. Uh, Orlando Sentinel reporting that the Gators have parted ways with defensive backs coach Corey Raymond and defensive line coach Sean Spencer. Uh, I I think Corey Raymond is a little bit of a surprise. Sean Spencer maybe not as much. Shane, just initial thoughts on that? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I I figured there'd be changes, uh, and it's happening quickly, obviously. You know, Corey Raymond – has a great track record of recruiting, I guess, but, you know, head coach got to make some decisions. Um, I guess those are the first two to go. Yeah. And um, the interesting part to me is, so you, you, on January 31st, you had a bunch of these contracts coming up. Sean Spencer's contract uh, was coming up January 31st. So um, I, I thought, Hey, if you're going to make a move, you might just wait until January 31st, let the contract expire, maybe tell the coach, Hey, we're not going to renew you um, because you've got this recruiting aspect. And now the guys that Sean Spencer have been recruiting, it's like, well, who's my coach? And you look at the guy like LJ McCray, who's one of the most important commits Florida has in this, in this, this cycle. And he's like, well, who the, who the hell is gonna be my coach now? Um, but I think Corey Raymond had just signed an extension. Uh, you need to give him a, a new title and more money to get him to probably keep him last year. Um but to me, if if I'm Billy Napier and 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 if I might be on the hot seat in 2024, I like Austin Armstrong. I think kind of what you need to kind of what you need to uh, what you led to was that they just need better players on defense. I think the scheme is good. I, I, I see a bunch of plays not being made with guys in position. Uh, and if I'm Billy Napier, I'm telling Austin Armstrong, hey, it's your defense. Um, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to hire, you know, your guys, whoever you want there. Yeah, I mean, you know, coaching is all about relationships and who you can get along with, who knows your system, who can coach your system. Uh, maybe they butted heads. I, I, I really don't know. Um, but you brought up a good point about L.J. McCray. You know, I'm sure Billy has a backup plan or he's already spoken to that kid to let him know who they possibly may hire. All right. Well, I'm going to get out of here and go yeah. go work go work on breaking news. So uh, yeah, I'll Shane, you got a, with, with Shane. You got a couple more minutes to talk to me, Shane. Sure. Okay. Well, Nick's Nick's got to handle Thank this breaking Shane, news. That's why it's great to be the recruiting reporter. He's got to go do that. Yeah. Uh, Shane, just it, it, you know, when you look back to that game with Florida State and they had so much control of the game, it felt like so much momentum. You didn't mind the 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 trick play, but could you sense how quickly after that did you sense that? Oh man, that you know it does feel like a breaking – it does feel like a, a, a momentum shifter right at that point. Did you sense you know, that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, we still – it was still 12 nothing. We punted them and yeah. punted it down there. But we we had them – I don't know if we stopped them for third down or it was going to be third down and we get the spitting penalty. I had yeah. two former players that were at the game text me and go, all right, that's going to cause us to lose the game. Yeah. 
because it, it was a huge, you know, you can talk about the, the flea flicker or whatever. I, I get it. I get it. But that penalty just absolutely killed us. And I don't know if that's worse than the shoe throw from a few years ago. You know, it, it's as, as you're looking at this team, Shane, so much of it, so much of their miscues can be attributed to youth, obviously, right? But how much? I guess that's the question. I guess, you know, when you look back, do you think it's all if you if you could say, Shane, they're five and seven, what would be the two or three biggest reasons to you why they're five and seven? Is it youth? Is it just lack of execution? Not enough players. You mentioned that earlier. What would you think would be the the two or three biggest reasons? Well, the the biggest reason to me is are the big guys, the interior, the five on front and on offense and the seven on defense that that those guys have got to become more SEC like players. But we've had some operational deals that have really killed us. Uh, the way the Arkansas game ended is inexcusable. Uh, Missouri fourth and seventeen, inexcusable. You know, you, if you if you're going to play coverage, play the play your assignment and don't let the guy complete the pass. Um, and we had our opportunities against Florida State. Now, I mean, I could probably think back earlier in the year. I mean, the team got better. Yeah. Um, but they did play a lot of young players, but about after game six or seven, you're you're not young anymore. I mean, yeah. you've been playing football your whole life. You get used to the speed of the game at the collegiate level. Um, so there, there's a lot of problems that we had this year. Um, I really thought we'd win seven or eight games, and and mostly that was due to Graham Mertz and the skill guys on offense. I didn't know how bad we'd be on defense. Yeah. When you look at the portal, Shane, what would you think are the maybe the two or three biggest needs they need to address? I know everybody's going to point to offensive line, offensive tackle, edge rusher. You got to be able to get off the field on third down, but that's me talking. You know more than me. So what would you and to well, Shane Matthews, what are the, you know? Well, I mean, it's it's a given. You got to go get some offensive linemen. Uh, yeah. but you got to get some dudes on defense that can affect the quarterback. Uh so edge rushers. We got to have linebacker play it needs to improve. Sometimes safety play, um, and then you got to worry about keeping your guys that are studs on your team. Um, but the problem with Gator fans sometimes, I try to tell them on my show is, we ain't the only teams that have problems, you know. So if there's that that really great edge rusher from whatever school that's in the portal, we're not going to be the only ones going after him. So we got to figure out a way through NIL, which that's it's all yeah. about money how we can pay them the most money. Yeah. And, you know, I cover the recruiting aspects for Florida. And so I I'm with you on that. And, and so they had a decommitment recently of a four-star defensive lineman, Shane, this year, Johnson from Georgia, but he wasn't really going to play next year. So to me, it's, I hate to say it. I mean, you need guys like that. You have to recruit the high school and Juco guys and the portal guys at the same time. I get it. You're building a program and you're building a team year by year at the same time. But if I'm running the team, I'm putting more money at this point, I think, into the portal. Yes, it'd be nice to get a Jeremiah Smith, the five-star recruit. I, I get all that, the five-star receiver, but they need immediate help, and he could give you that, and a few high school guys could, but not many. It's hard. A lot of the greatest Gator players ever, Shane, didn't see the light of day in year one. They didn't get on the field, right? I mean, guys you played, guys you played with that were all Americans by year three and four – uh, Jacquez, for instance, I know he got hurt. He's, he only saw a little bit of playing time early. Ike and Riddell did. And, and, and in fact, in 1992, I believe you had two true freshman offensive tackles playing yes. on the line with you. Uh, but that's not yeah. ideal. That's not what you want. And I think fans sometimes look at these five-star recruits and say he's a day-one starter. Well, there aren't many of those. So I'm with you on that. Go into the portal uh, and hit those needs. Uh, who was the biggest surprise to you on the team this year? You don't sound like you were surprised by Mertz at all. In fact, Lee McGriff told me that you told him before the season that you, hey, this watch out for this guy, and you were right. But who did surprise you, Shane, in a, in a good way? We'll say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I really like both our running backs. I, it's not much of a surprise because we saw them both last year. Um, and I know people get – upset that ETN get enough, doesn't get enough touches. Montreal gets too many, whatever. But Montreal's a good, much better pass blocker. Uh, but I guess, gosh, that's a great question. I, whew, Trey Wilson, I mean, I knew he was going to be dynamic, but you still you aren't sure until he actually gets in a game-type situation against SEC caliber players. But uh, he's a game-changer, man. He's a guy that I would love to design plays for. 
Uh, Shane, uh, Kevin Carter and Larry Kennedy both talked to me recently, and I want to say it was about the hiring of Rich Tootin, right, as the strength coach. And I'm not going to get you to be critical of anybody right now. But how important – was was Rich there when you were there? Was Did he get hired after so, you left? So I was fortunate, I guess, because I was never a big weight room guy. <laughs> so when I came in, when I signed with Florida, Tootin left to go – I don't know if he went to the pros or to North Carolina. I can't remember. He went to North Carolina first, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so then when I graduated, Spurrier hired him back. So I never had him. But but the strength coach is one of the most important people on your staff because they spend more time with the athlete than the regular coaches do or your position coaches. So that's a crucial, crucial person that uh, has to coach or do his job at a high level. Shane, you don't know me from Adam, but I was lucky enough to cover the team for the student paper back when you played. And, and as you recall, Spurrier, C. Spurrier let the media out there at practice every day. Remember, we'd sit up there with Coach Jones and Norm Carlson. And, and, and sometimes he'd have you guys, not sometimes, a lot of times, just snapping the ball with nothing else. No, just, just practicing things so slowly, so process-oriented until you got it right. How much, is practice how much have practices changed from what you see today? They just seem like they're so fast paced to back when you were in practice at Florida. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, Coach Burr and I talk, and we only I, I go to a few practices here and there, but not a yeah. lot. Um, but it's all timed, and it doesn't matter. Each period, five, ten minutes, whatever. They blow that horn, you go to the next. Where back in our day, it was kind of time, but it wasn't. If if we if we were screwing around in a drill or whatever, we'd stay there till we got it correct. But we threw routes on air, meaning no defensive backs, just, you know, four four lines of wideouts, a couple of quarterbacks, and you threw routes for like 45 minutes to an hour. And that's why we were a good throwing team, in my opinion, because you had timing, spacing. You could tell how guys ran certain routes. Teams don't do that anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. when You know, I, I covered Auburn for a bunch of years, and it was just these fast – everything was fast about moving fast and – I never forget Shane. I covered a high school basketball practice once. Bobby Hurley's dad, the, the famous coach at Jersey City St. Mm -hmm. Anthony, they worked on one play for an hour, one play because one kid couldn't set a pick right. And I thought, man, that's how you do it. But again, this is a different game now. It's it, you know, it's uh, yeah, everybody does it different. And, and, yeah. and what they do now, it's it's all time. Like you said, this this period, they're blowing the horn. You're going to the next. And if you like, say seven on seven is a ten minute period, or it's twelve plays. And the quarterback throws an interception. They just go to the next play. Whereas back in our day, and, and every team that I was on and teams that I coached, I want to talk to him right now. Okay, why did you throw it there? Yeah. What did you see? They like to coach off tape. I'm not saying Florida. I mean, it's pretty much every team in America does this now. But I'd rather let's work on it right now while it's fresh in your mind because two hours later when you're in the meeting room, you don't remember what you saw. The uh, the problems on the up front on both sides of the ball those aren't easily corrected and even if you land guys on the portal Shane they may only be there for a year so it's become the, the problem is once you dig yourself in a hole on the line of scrimmage it's very hard to dig yourself out of it uh, but how many people would you like to see them add on the offensive side of the ball through the portal without naming you know this guy can't play well, or that guy? what would you what I mean, would be ideal for you well I think you need to try to get at least three high caliber oh, wow. offensive linemen mm -hmm. I, I really do because I mean, we've had trouble at the tackle position. We all know that. Now, Austin Barber, uh, you know, he hasn't played here recently because of an injury. But I think the I think you got to look at the portal today, almost like in the draft. You know, best available, who can help our football team? And it may not there may not be any linemen in there that they think are worthy. But you got to try to address uh, and get the best players you can to help the Gators win games. But again, like I tell everybody, if there's a good player in there. We ain't the only team going after. Them. That's right. It's a feeding. Hey, look, it's an all-out feeding frenzy. And Shane, here's the here's the the interesting part. You've got to know the guys going in the portal well before he actually even announces he's going in the portal. You need connections. You need a staff that's connected to high school coaches and guys on the bottom on the, on the grassroots level across the country to be aware that this is happening. Because if you don't offer a guy until the day he's in the portal, sometimes you're already late. You know, sometimes you're already late to the party. Shane, let me ask you about Austin Barber. If you got a few minutes, again, we're joined by former All-American quarterback for the Florida Gators, Shane Matthews. Uh, Shane, Austin Barber, do you think you know, it wasn't a great season for him? You, and obviously he was hurt some too. Do, if, if they can get some help in the portal at tackle, 
would you move him back to right tackle from what you've seen? Uh, I haven't really thought about that. I mean, if he feels more comfortable there, because I think he's a pretty good football player. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's his position that he's more comfortable with, I'd have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, now, we, we've got some staff changes coming. A lot of these, and again, for those who have missed this, the Orlando Sentinels reporting that Sean Spencer and Corey Raymond are leaving the staff at Florida. Shane, a lot of times these schools wait till after signing day to do this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see it every year. Right? The day after signing day, there's three coaches announced that they're leaving. There is a little bit of risk involved when this kind of move is made at this point. Now, Florida doesn't uh, have too many defensive linemen committed. Actually, not really one true defensive lineman committed. Some guys that can play up there. Uh, secondary, they've got four guys committed right now, I believe. Uh, are you surprised at the timing of this, of these announcements? Yeah, possibly. Um, but, you know, Billy may just say, you know what, I know I'm going to part ways with them. I'm not going to – this way they can maybe he, – maybe he's giving them an opportunity to find another job. You know, yeah. he's, he's a pretty genuine guy. And, you know, the coaching profession is not easy. And people lose their job. Families have to move. Kids have to move schools. It's tough. I mean, they make a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. maybe that's why. But uh, Or maybe he was told we need to make some changes like today. <laughs> and he's well, Shane, Shane we, we've got a guy asking a question, and the guy below him says you've already answered this a million times. But uh, Matthew wants to know if you'd ever consider coaching at Florida. Is that is it just you like no, what you're doing? I'm, or I'm, too, you know? I'm too old. I mean, I love it. Um, I don't think people, I mean, if I could, and this is just fantasy work, if I could just show yeah. up for a few practices and help and be a consultant or whatever, I would love that. But I, I'm at the point in my life now where I like my free time. I like to play golf a couple of times a week with my buddies. And, uh, I don't think people really understand the grind of coaching football. I mean, it's, you could probably get about 14 days off the entire year. And it's nonstop, especially in today's world, because there there's no just recruiting season. It is year round. You're recruiting high school kids. You're trying to continue to keep the kids on your on your roster to stay put. Uh, I just it's nuts. Uh, you got time for three or four more questions from yeah. me? You good? Okay, we yeah. appreciate it. Shane, let me ask you this. Um, are you? We, we kind of dug into this a little bit earlier. Encouraged and discouraged from the game itself. But what about the program? Are you more encouraged right now? Let me, well, how do I say this? Are you encouraged at all going into next season? Are you total wait and see mode? Are you discouraged? What, what's your mindset as a former player? But you understand the process. You cover the games. You see things that maybe we don't see. Well, I mean, I, kind of both, kind of both wait and see. But I, I'm in, I mean, I really like the things Billy's done with the program. Like it was a mess. I don't think people realize that. He's brought in some pretty good players through the portal that have pretty much been our best players and he's recruited pretty well, but we got to win games. And I think he needs help on staff. I really do. Cause I know a lot of the procedural stuff, the delay of games, those type of things that has nothing to do with X's and O's and whether he needs to hire and just be the CEO. Um, see, I, I have no problem with that, but I also have no problem with him being the play caller. If the other coaches do their job, of watching the play clock and things of that nature. So I think there will be other people, uh, other staff changes. Um, but, you know, next year is a huge, huge year, and, and we gotta, we got to get this thing going in the right direction. Yeah, you make a good point. That, that, that was, but about staff changes, I think people are going to say, well, wait a second, don't they have a big enough staff already, is the joke being that they've got this gigantic staff. But, uh, you know <laughs> – Three straight losing seasons, Shane, for the first time since the 1940s. And, 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 you know, Gator fans in the 1980s, I mean, six wins was, you know, God, this is yeah, the end of the world. And in, in 1990s, uh, I think they had, you had a couple nine win seasons and people were jumping off buildings. And, and this has been difficult to swallow. Um, the logo isn't as strong as it has been, Shane. Um, and just, I just wanted to get your thoughts just on just overall your feelings of, you know, we talked about you're, you're optimistic about the future, but you've got some wait and see. But just as a former player who left his blood on the field, is, is it just is it a little hard to swallow right now? The, the three oh, straight losing seasons, no, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's no question. Um, I try to be realistic too, though. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you look at all the, the the really good programs, they go in these cycles. Okay, 
let's you know, and people that listen to my show hear me talk about this all the time. Alabama has won a bunch of national titles, but they were under Bear Bryant, one under Gene Stallings, and a bunch under Saban. All their other coaches failed. Uh, Georgia, Vince Dooley, Mark Rick was an st- outstanding coach. Never won a national title, won a couple of yeah. SECs. And then Kirby's doing his thing. So I think what coach – I mean, Florida had some decent teams under, you know, Doug Dickey, Charlie Pell, Galen Hall. <laughs> but Spurrier did it all. He changed, he changed what the Gator fans, the way they thought about college football. He got them to winning games and winning championships. And then Urban came along. So we've had two Hall of Fame coaches in that, what, 18 uh, year period yeah. that dominated college football. I don't know if Billy's that guy or not. Well, we'll have to wait and see. But we've gone through four or five coaches trying to find that next guy to get us back to being relevant. And if it was that easy, everybody would find that coach. You know, Hall of Fame coaches just don't fall off trees. That's right. Uh, Shane, last question. You, you, you mentioned that you're getting text messages from former players. I, what, what is the vibe in those group chats between you and your former teammates? And what, what, Are they as optimistic as you? Are they as co- more concerned? Are they kind of just, hey, what's going on? Or what, what, What's the general mood of those well, guys? I think, they, I think what they mean or what they think Shane means a lot, quite frankly. Well, I, I think, you know, some of these text messages I get from guys that, you know, guys that played, there's a lot of guys that play that understood, understand football. And there's some guys that played at Florida that don't understand football, you know? Um, so they're, they all want to win games and they have their doubts and then, you know, they'll get excited. But the, the, the bottom line is whether Billy's the right guy or not, we're going to have to wait another year to find out. I think everybody wants to because he's open, opened the place up to the former players. Um, you know, the, the guys that usually text me, it's about this player, that play during a game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what did the, why did the left tackle or the right tackle do this? Or why did he, you know, everybody's questioning play call. That's like, I think you can watch any game in America, America, any game in America at any level and question play call. Nobody's questioning the plays that work. That's right. It's only the plays that don't work. Yeah. All right. Gator great Shane Matthews, three-time All-SEC. I think you were two-time SEC player of the year, fifth place in the Heisman Trophy voting, 9,000 career yards, just an unbelievable career, and then a long NFL career, which we didn't even get to after that. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We'll let you go. I'm going to stick around and answer some of these questions, but – we just uh, can't thank you enough, man. We appreciate it, and great success to you in the future. Hope your golf swing, which I've heard is fantastic, is still hanging in there pretty good. It's, it's all right. I appreciate it, man. Y'all take right. care. You take care, Shane. See you, man. All right, Shane Matthews, man, what a guy. I'll tell you, he was – and I have I speak, I, I speak uh, with some knowledge here. Uh, having covered him in 1992, his last season with Florida, uh, just a fantastic guy. It was always a great interview, uh, gracious with his time. Good, thoughtful answers, as you just saw, and you know, obviously a fantastic player. And in that 1992 season, he went in as one of the Heisman Trophy favorites, just like Kerwin Bell did in 1997. But they just simply didn't have the players around him, particularly on the offensive line, in 1992. Otherwise, Shane Matthews might have been hoisting that Heisman Trophy. You never know. Did finish fifth the year before. The winner in 1991, Desmond Howard. How about that, Marshall Falk finished ninth that year, four spots behind. Shane Matthews, Gator Gray. All right, let's get to some of your questions here. And, uh, you know, look, I mean, guys, there's a lot going on. The the uh, the news of, of Sean Spencer, the defensive line coach, and Corey Raymond leaving the program uh, is significant. And uh, make sure you go to GatorsOnline.com. We're going to have more on that, what it means, uh, any further details we can get. Um, I'm not surprised, uh, given the production of the defensive line, wasn't what everybody thought it would be. Uh, this season. And then, you know, obviously they recruited very well on the defensive line the last cycle, but this cycle, the defensive line recruiting has been kind of just average if we're going to be totally honest and actually not even average. They don't have a true defensive lineman committed. Now, LJ McCray is a defensive lineman slash edge. Florida likes him more as an edge guy. Uh, Kendall Jackson's an edge, but could play on the defensive line. But, but Nasir Johnson decommitting, Makai Burrow decommitting, 
Um, and so it just, and then you factor in the on-field results. And again, we don't know, I, I'm, I'm doing the show. I don't have any of the details here. This could have been uh, his decision, uh, but it just didn't seem like uh, you know, when your defensive line just isn't what you're used to seeing at the University of Florida. And when you have the portal and they brought in guys like Cam Jackson, who was fairly good, but you know, I wouldn't call him like an elite SEC defensive lineman. Uh, that's not Gator football. I think everybody can agree on that. All right, so let's see. Uh, let's see if there's any questions in here. If you got any, please ask them. We'll, I'll take as many as I can. Somebody asked a recruiting question earlier, and I'm going to try to get to that right now. So let me see if I can find that. We appreciate everybody stopping by. All right, uh, Matthew says, Keith, any news on the portal? Not yet. Now, what we know is Florida has been compiling big lists, doing their evaluations, obviously, uh, they're getting tips on who may be entering the portal. So they, this as to not get caught kind of with your pants down, you know, uh, you have to know, like Chain and I talked about, you got to know guys are going in the portal before they go in the portal. And I think UF is addressing that. Uh, I think it's a staff that's uh, made inroads with enough people now at the grassroots level where they're learning more, they're getting more information on who's going to go in the portal. So uh, obviously they need to make a big dent in the portal this cycle. Shane says three offensive linemen. I was thinking two, but three would be great. Uh, but at least one that is a bona fide, high-level SEC talent. Sometimes role players are fine, too. You have to have those guys. You have to have depth. Not everybody you bring into the portal is going to be a star. But they do need some stars. They need an offensive tackle that, again, is in the top half of the SEC. They need an edge rusher that is in the top half of the SEC. If you can't get off the field on third down, you are nothing and you are not going to win a lot of games as we've seen. I still think Florida will go in the portal to uh, find a linebacker. You have to have more depth there. I don't care what they've got coming in as freshmen. Those guys aren't going to be ready right away probably. Uh, and you've got Shamar James, Scooby Williams. You have some other guys coming back, but they need a veteran voice out there. I think you need a veteran receiver to replace Ricky Pearsall. Uh, like Shane, I don't know why Andy Jean and the younger guys didn't really play much this year, but you need to replace that veteran talent with another veteran talent, like a guy that's a 35 to 45 catch guy that can make big plays, can be a leader on the field, and can be a leader in the locker room. I think you're going to need some defensive back help. I don't think there's any question about that. So Florida has a lot of needs and, and defensive tackle if you can find somebody. So a lot of needs. Uh, again, no question about that. It's going to be a busy portal season, and uh, they know it. Uh, you've got the young talent returning. You've got a solid freshman class that will be coming in next year. But how many of those guys will truly be ready to play? Shane says the defensive line's got to get better and the offensive line's got to get better. Well, of the four offensive line commits, I don't know that any of those guys are ready to contribute in year one, quite frankly, based on what I've seen from film. Now, I'm no professional evaluator, though. The, the Rob Sale, Darnell Stapleton, Billy Napier, they may see things differently. On the defensive line, L.J. McCray, again, uh, edge, L.J. McCray is a guy that should be able to, at six foot six, 275 pounds, come in as an early enrollee and contribute early on in the process. All right, so that, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a handful of high school guys that can come in. Can five-star safety Xavier Phil Samine come in and contribute in year one at the safety position? Probably. We saw Jordan Castell do that this year uh, and at times really, really struggled because of the lack of experience, obviously. And at other times, he played quite at a high level. Xavier Phil Samin has the ability to come in and play in year one. That is significant. Uh, but there's not a ton of those guys. It's a very, very good class. But if you're counting on a ton of freshmen to come in and make big impacts, you're in a bad spot. So look for Florida to hit the portal hard. Okay, look for Florida to hit the portal hard. But again, it's just now heating up. This takes time. You have to reach out to them. You have to uh, make contact with them, then make contact with you. They got to like you. You got to like them. The NIL situation has got to be just right. And if you're Florida, hopefully you have set aside a certain amount of money for your portal needs. Because, again, we've seen it at FSU and other programs. You can thrive in the portal and take a significant step when those players complement solid players already on your team. So let's see here. All right. Uh, so I'm going to take a few of these questions. It's tough. Remember, i got to work with these people over in Gainesville. All right. Is Rob Sale next? Uh, and that's alluding to will he be on the staff? We don't know. We haven't heard any chatter there. Quite frankly, we hadn't heard much chatter about Corey Raymond, but we know that Corey Raymond 
being kind of a wanted quantity and a known quantity was always a guy that they were either that, that would land on his feet or maybe an NFL team would come after. He's so well thought of. So I, again, I was a little bit surprised at the timing of that, but not surprised as a whole that he would leave the program because uh, there was even some chatter last year that maybe he'd consider going to the NFL or somewhere else. And uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if LF, LSU wanted him back, quite frankly, given their defensive back struggles this year. But Sean Spencer, again, defensive line, just not, it just didn't seem to be making a lot of progress there. And I, Maybe that's not a fair assessment. I'm just going by the on-field results. The defensive line did play at a high level just the other night. So, all right. Let's see here. All right. I've got to go through this. <laughs> Looking at these questions, we'll try to get to a couple of them, and then we're going to get going here. All right. Uh, Andy Jean has been battling injuries uh, this season, hasn't he? Uh, probably. But I still think people thought that he would play more. Um, you know, uh, they just – I think coaches often are guilty of falling in love with their guys, riding with those guys, and then the season ends. It's like, oh, my God, we didn't get this guy enough throws. So um, probably a little bit of element of that, too. All right, who's getting fired next? Well, I don't know. You know, there were some people that thought, let's see, is Billy going to be told that he's got to make changes? Will anyone tell him? And if nobody does, uh, what will he do? And, it, it, and so we don't know quite yet if he was told that changes had to come. My belief is Billy's a smart guy and had made assessments on how he wanted to improve the program. My guess is this is not the end. My guess is this is not the end. Now, again, why was the timing of these uh, of this announcement, why is this significant? Uh, it's because uh, that signing day is a few weeks away, and usually and often teams will wait till after signing day to make these kinds of moves. So anyway, that's where we're at. Well, look, we've got to go get to work. Nick had to leave earlier. And I appreciate uh, you all uh, being patient with us. We had to do this on the fly tonight. Shane Matthews was very gracious with his time. Nick had to leave to go work on Sean Spencer and Corey Raymond departure stories. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate everybody stopping by. Uh, for Nick Delatore of Gators Online and Gator Great Shane Matthews, I'm Keith Niebuhr with Gators Online. And I think that is it. I appreciate everybody. Y'all take care. I'm trying to... Uh, <laughs> trying to figure one thing out here. Want to get that off the screen. Y'all take care. We're going to have a recruiting show uh, either Tuesday or Wednesday where we'll take all your questions. We're just trying to get caught up on all the news. I've got to run. Take care, everybody. <laughs>